Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone who is tuning in for the second day of the conference on the geopolitics and economics of technology in the Indo-Pacific. This conference is part of the EU Asia project that is located at the Robert Schumann Center for Advanced Studies, the European University Institute in Florence, Italy. There are three great panels in front of us today, and please let me introduce our distinguished speakers for panel four on 5G and data, the backbone of the fourth industrial revolution and of geopolitical tensions, 5G, ORAN and data regulation. Martina Ferracane is a Max Weber Fellow at the EUI. Before that, she was awarded a PhD at the Hamburg University. At the EUI, Dr. Ferracane is currently leading the Digital Trade Integration Project, which aims to create a data set and index on digital trade integration policies. Rika Kamijima Tsunoda is the Deputy Director at the Digital Agency of the Government of Japan. Kamijima Tsunoda-san is responsible for digital identity to shape the concept of data free flow with trust, TFFT, in the Japanese Digital Agency. Rika completed a research paper on Japan-US 5G policy coordination as part of her paper on Japan-US 5G policy coordination Oh, sorry, I repeated that twice <laughs> as part of her graduate studies at the Harvard Kennedy School, where she specialized in national security policy. Associate Professor Simon Tay is the chairman of the Singapore Institute of International Affairs. He is concurrently a tenured associate professor teaching international law at the National University of Singapore Faculty of Law. Professor Tay has published several books, including Asia Alone, The Dangerous Post-Crisis Divide for America. Our distinguished discussion, Mihoko uh, Matsubara, is responsible for cybersecurity thought leadership activities as Chief Cybersecurity Strategist, NTT Corporation. And uh, Ms. Matsubara-san is an awarded author of a cybersecurity book. I am Maria Saluste, the chair of this panel, and I will also make a couple of remarks later on as a discussant. I am currently writing my PhD at the EUI on cross-border data flows and regulatory cooperation. Prior to this, uh, I worked in the European Commission on Trade and Services with a focus on free trade agreements and in the World Customs Organization. Before starting, a quick remark also to the audience. Dear audience, if you have any questions for the speakers throughout the discussion, please send them via the chat function. Without further ado, I will give the floor to Martina. Great. Uh, thanks, uh, Maria. And uh, uh, nice to see everyone uh, connecting from all over the world. Um, well, um, my presentation, I, I don't know if you're seeing my slides already. Yes, you are. Uh, my presentation is uh, is, is just a, um, a work, presentation of a work in progress. I, I've just started looking into uh, the geopolitics of data in the Indo-Pacific. So I, I want to present some preliminary results of my research, but I really don't have any answers. I have a lot of questions and uh, still uh, uh, points uh, open. Uh, so uh, I will uh, present them as I go. Um, so, well, what I plan to do is, uh, uh, first of all, I have looked into the regulatory um, um, policies when it comes to cross-border flow of data in uh, 15 uh, Indo-Pacific economies. So I will present you the result of the research and trying to provide in a simple way uh, and in a simple table uh, how the different countries are regulating cross-border data flows and which is the model that they are using when doing so. Uh, and then I will uh, uh, enlarge a bit the picture uh, by providing uh, um, an example and the three uh, main of three main initiatives that uh, 
show how the Indo-Pacific is a geopolitical arena when it comes to cross-border data flow uh, policies. And, and these are the EU adequacy decisions that have recently been taken um, uh, in uh, with two uh, Southeast Asian economies, uh, the uh, CPTPP agreement and the RCEP agreement, uh, two agreements which are me mega uh, trade deals uh, that have recently uh, been agreed um, in, in the Indo-Pacific region. So, uh, first of all, regarding the domestic regulatory environment, um, I have used as a um, framework for the analysis a taxonomy that uh, uh, I've developed together with my colleague Eric um, for a recent paper that uh, it, it was a background paper for the World Bank uh, World Development uh, Report. And uh, we have uh, um, identified the three main uh, regulatory models uh, for uh, uh, regulating personal uh, data flows. Uh, and uh, these models are pretty like uh, clear to people uh, working on, on these issues. There is the open model usually advocated by the US uh, of free flow of data. Um, and the conditional model or of uh, regulatory safeguards usually advocated by the EU and now slowly also becoming a, a model uh, uh, of reference for many economists in which data can be transferred only under certain conditions. And then the control model, usually advocated by China, in which uh, uh, data uh, transfers are subject to strict uh, regulation or sometimes are even banned altogether. So we used these models uh, in our paper uh, to uh, look into the um, regulatory environment in under 16 countries. And back then, uh, in, in we uh, looked only at the regulation on personal data. Uh, what I did now is to expand uh, the analysis and look into uh, um, how uh, 15 economies in the Indo-Pacific region are um, regulating all types of data. And, and this is the result um, of the research. Oh, sorry, um, I will go into this uh, in a second. So what um, um, I've, I've listed countries starting from the most uh, open uh, to the least open, more or less. It's really hard to make a, a ranking. Uh, but we have on one end two countries, uh, Hong Kong and the Philippines, which basically have no restrictions at all. So they follow fully the open data transfer model. Uh, we then have... Uh, uh, two other countries, Pakistan and Australia, which tend to follow the open model. So I would still categorize under the open model uh, um, of data of data transfers. Uh, but um, in the case of Pakistan, there is some uh, restriction on the uh, transfer of data to certain countries. So they ban transfer to some countries that they don't recognize. And in the case of Australia, there are some conditions on the transfer of personal data, but very light, and a ban on the transfer of health data. Then there is the um, um, conditional model, countries following more uh, the uh, typical EU model of uh, transfer of uh, uh, free flow of transfer of uh, uh, of um, uh, the norm of any data except personal data, which is subject to conditions. And uh, this is model is followed by Japan and is also followed by Singapore. Um, is is also a reference for New Zealand, although New Zealand has some other restrictions on tax and accounting data. Uh, Thailand is another country that I would categorize as following this model, although there are, there are some restrictions on, on financial sector. And Korea uh, also um, tends to have this uh, um, this model, and this is also um, uh, confirmed by the fact that there is a, a EU adequacy decision with Korea, but uh, Korea historically has had the restrictions on, in the financial sector, which now are slowly being lifted, and also restrictions on uh, location uh, services, uh, which as some security and uh, political rationale. Uh, then um, there's uh, Taiwan, uh, which also follows uh, the conditional approach uh, for personal data, also for financial data, and as some restrictions on the transfer of data to uh, China. And then here we are moving more towards the control model, but I will still categorize India under the conditional model. Also, there, has, there are more and more restrictions on uh, public data and also on payment data. Um, and uh, then there are four economies which I would consider um, to be uh, following the control model, so the, the China-led approach on, on data flows, uh, and these are Indonesia, 
Although Indonesia is the only country together with Korea that has actually reduced the level of restrictions on data in the past years, uh, but still uh, in the case of, of Indonesia, there are still a lot of restrictions uh, for uh, system operators uh, working in the public sector uh, in the and also for financial uh, data. Um, and then uh, Russia, Vietnam and China uh, have uh, uh, a wide variety of restrictions in a lot of sectors. I will not list all of them, but basically virtually all data, I would say, is under this control model. So this already provides an overview of how different countries are um, regulating data in the region. And uh, uh, before I was uh, uh, I skipped this slide in which uh, what we we found in our research is that the open transfer model is associated with more trade. Uh, so countries having this model trade more with each other. The conditional model is associated with less or more trade depending on the sector. So there is really uh, not a clear impact on trade and the control model is associated with less trade. And what this means is that when it comes to the open transfer model, the rationale be behind the country's decision to uh, undertake and uh, use this model is probably the economy and trade, while in the case of the conditional transfers, there is other rationals which are important and we all know about the EU value-based approach, uh, also uh, shared by Japan with the free flow with trust, with trust approach. And when it comes to control, there is uh, probably a public security, public order um, uh, rationale, which is more important than the economy in this case. So I will then skip and go to the next slide in which uh, I uh, want to present three um, the, the, the three um, initiatives I was referring to before um, to add another piece of the puzzle when analyzing this um, uh, decisions and these uh, uh, policies followed by the countries. Uh, they, uh, first of all, the adequacy decisions of the EU uh, with Japan, this is a mutual decision. So not only the EU is granting adequacy, but also Japan is granting adequacy to the EU, uh, was uh, uh, taken in 2019. And this is the first uh, time there is an adequacy decision with the Southeast uh, Asian country. And uh, the only other Asian economy that already go had an adequacy was uh, New Zealand. So it's a very important uh, uh, also tool for the EU to promote this approach. And what is interesting is that Japan has uh, un, um, followed and uh, em, em, uh, embraced the EU model only very recently, in 2015, with the amendment to the privacy law. So this was not a traditional approach for Japan. While in the case of Korea, this is a more, the most recent adequacy decision. This is something that was already in the Korean law since 2011. Um, so the, the conditional approach and the safeguards for the, for the transfer, uh, cross-border transfers. Uh, the CPTPP um, um, agreement is very interesting from a geopolitical perspective because uh, it is a EU-led agreement, was a EU-led agreement, then the EU, uh, the US, sorry, it was a US-led agreement, the US pulled out uh, uh, during the Trump administration, but several other countries have uh, uh, followed through and uh, um, and this agreement uh, was uh, uh, then agreed in 2019 and uh, is the first time there is a, a comprehensive horizontal uh, agreement on the free flow of data. So it's uh, very important when it comes to data policies and there are um, other commitments on the uh, location of uh, uh, data uh, servers. Uh, but what is important is that there are some exceptions which are pretty limited. So there's, there's uh, countries uh, cannot easily deviate from the commitment on free flow of data under this agreement. And, uh, um, and in fact, the countries that have, have agreed to this uh, uh, to the CPTPP are mostly countries having an open uh, model of transfer of data or a conditional model, except Vietnam, that however has, has had a period of five years to adjust its policies on data. And so far they have not done so. And finally, uh, the RCEP is an interesting uh, uh, recent initiative. Uh, it's interesting because it's the first uh, um, uh, initiative in which China has agreed in principle to a commitment on data flows. It's also groundbreaking in scope. It's a very, uh, uh, covering a, a very important percentage of, percentage of uh, international uh, trade. 
Um, and uh, the, in this case, there are commitments on data which are similar to the CPTPP, but in this case, the exceptions are extremely wide to the point that basically it is uh, they are self uh, judging and a country can uh, uh, practically um, impose any sort of restriction on cross-border data transfers without any problem and uh, these decisions cannot be disputed. So this means that basically there is no agreement on data transfers in, in this case and um, but nevertheless it remains the first time China has uh, agreed to anything that has the word free flow of data on it. Um, so to conclude, I what I've done and this is still a work in progress is that I try to put together here um, all the commitments uh, taken uh, by uh, these 15 economies in the um, when it comes to data flows. So on top of the CPTPP that I showed, the UADEQUACY and the RCEP, there is also the APEC cross-border privacy rules, the other FTAs which follow the CPTPP language, and the DEAS and DEPAS, and we'll, we'll hear from the, uh, about these agreements with Professor uh, Tay. Uh, but just uh, a, a, a few uh, things which uh, emerge from this uh, table are that uh, uh, first of all, there is not an Indo-Pacific uh, data uh, club. Uh, it, it's clear that there are very diverse types of ways in which countries are regulating the data flows in the region. Um, what is interesting is that the countries with the conditional model are those that tend to have the highest level of commitments in all the diverse types of agreements which are available uh, in the region. Um, the countries instead with following the control model are those that are virtually absent from any sort of agreement. There is some commitments, but uh, very, um, very rarely. Um, also, uh, what is interesting is that three countries, Pakistan, India and Russia, are absent from any commitment whatsoever, and they follow different approaches on data. Um, and uh, uh, finally, uh, it is interesting that China is uh, asked uh, to join and uh, applied to join to the CPTPP and the DEPA agreement. And uh, about this, we can discuss maybe during the Q&A, but I found this uh, this application very challenging uh, to, to to address and to, to understand. So that's all I wanted to say for this first uh, 10 minutes. And thanks for the time. Thank you very much, Martina, for this uh, interesting presentation. Um, I'll now give the floor to Rika Kamichina uh, Tsunoda to continue this interesting panel discussion. And thank you for your introduction. And can you see my slide? Yes. Okay. Thank you. And thank you for the introduction. And I'm going to start my presentation. Okay, and thank you for having me. And so what I'm planning today is to share an overview of Japan's 5G and beyond 5G, which is 6G strategy and US Japan's policy coordination in this area. So also today, I'll be talking about Japanese government 5G policy. Uh, please note, I'm here as an individual and I'm not representing the digital agency or Japanese government. Uh, today's research is based on my graduate studies at Harvard Kennedy School. So first, as my main argument, uh, this is what steps Japan believes is needed to produce reliable 5G networks. And the Japanese government is not only trying to remove untrusted ICT vendors, but also to change the oligopolistic 5G market, uh, market structure by investing reliable 5G technologies and to restructure the 5G market by promoting open run and intellectual property and standardization for 5G and beyond the 5G. So for, let me briefly explain what is the open run. And open run, which is a right figure, um, con contrast with single vendor locking model, which is a uh, left figure. And open run encourages multiple vendors to share 5G network through open interface. And this helps increase network transparency and hold vendors more accountable. And in addition, mobile operators can reconsider the choice of providers after they invest in their 5G networks. And so open run encourages 5G market competition and helps vendors get more opportunities to join global 5G market. So then um, I'm going to share the current 5G market situations and how Japan and the US see the challenges to build reliable 5G networks. 
This pie chart shows global mobile base station market, market share in 2021. And currently, the Chinese, uh, Chinese, European, and Korean firms have taken up 90% of share of global mobile base station market. And Chinese 5G vendors adopt vendor lock-in model um, by deploying proprietary hardware equipment. The vendor lock-in model has security challenges. First challenge is that proprietary hardware makes 5G networks black box. And so mobile operators are not sure what network systems a vendor implants in their 5G networks. And the second challenge is that proprietary hardware makes it harder for multiple vendors to join 5G market network business. And the third challenge is a supply chain risk. And when one vendor's um, proprietary equipment dominates a company's 5G networks, the company uh, will rely on the vendor to import equipment and upgrade the network. So next, uh, we are going to look at the 5G standardization race. So Japanese ICT firms in total hold only 15% of 5G standards essential patents. And NTT Docomo, and Japan's largest telecom telecom company holds most of them. And this means development of um, development standards essential patents in Japan is not quite competitive. And bar chart in the light shows Ferry has ranked top in 5G standardization proposals for uh, 3GPP, which is an um, international standards development organization that sets specification for 5G technology. And the percentage of um, set standards essential patents owned by Japanese ICT firms has been declining. So if the situation continues, Japan would fall behind other ICT firms in 6G development competition. And this chart shows beyond the 5G and 6G R&D capabilities of major countries, including Japan. And deep blue box shows technology fears where a country takes a lead in 6G element technologies competition. Japan has advantages in all photonic networks, quantum cryptography, and network virtualization. And take network virtualization as an example, Japanese mobile carriers like Dakdem and Docomo have already implemented virtual radio access network in commercial networks. Okay. So let's move on the Japanese government beyond the 5G strategy. Uh, in Japan, Japanese Prime Minister and National Basic Science and Technology Plan have set the tone for developing next generation infrastructure technologies, including 5G and beyond 5G, and establishing a resilient supply chain. And Japanese government published the Beyond 5G Promotion Strategy in June 2020, which shows basic policy to develop 6G. Um, there are three pillars in the strategy. First pillar is R&D. Uh, which gives a financial support for beyond 5G R&D. And the second pillar is standardization, uh, which is uh, going to promote open architecture and de facto standards to create more opportunities for ICT companies to enter 5G market. And the third pillar is 5G network deployment, which promotes um, deploying 5G network nationwide to create an environment for beyond 5G or 6G networks. And this is the timeline of Beyond 5G promotion strategy. And the Japanese government aims to put 60 strategies into practical use by 2030. And to achieve the goal, the Japanese government has put intensive effort in 60 component technology by 2025. And the Beyond 5G strategy recommended specified areas that Japan should focus on in 5G and 6G R&D and promoting Japanese ICT firms 6G development in these areas helps decreasing dependence on supply chains on foreign companies and bolstering international competitiveness and national security. And the Japanese government created funding schemes for R&D for 6G. In December 2020, the Japanese government allocated $485 million for funding R&D for 6G. The fund has been used to develop 6G component technologies. The Japanese government is also going to use budget for building testbed facilities for companies to develop these technologies. And NICT, the National Institute of ICT, uh, has open, so openly sought uh, 6G R&D project proposals. 
And there are three types of R&D pro programs. So I'll skip the details, but more than 40 projects have been adopted so far. And Japanese government aims to boost public-private cooperation for developing 6G. In December 2020, the Japanese government established Beyond the 5G Promotion Consortium. This organization promotes collaboration among industry, academia, and the government to share their R&D and standardization effort. And in the Beyond the 5G Promotion Strategy, the Japanese government aims to propose 6G technology technical requirements for international standards. Since it's effective to enhance Japan's international presence, Japan has nominated Mr. Onoue as a candidate for the next director of ITUT. So lastly, I'd like to briefly share current US and Japan 5G and 6G policy coordination in bilateral and multilateral arena. So in bilateral arena, there are two major um, cooperation uh, um, the conference. Um, the first is a US-Japan policy coordination dialogue on the internet economy, which is the annual conference and the US and Japanese government um, published joint statement. And they highlight the value of open and interoperable 5G supply chain, supplier diversity. And also they, um, they um, cooperate um, in the third country to, to develop secure 5G and beyond, 5G and beyond 5G and open run and virtual run. And also, um, the Japan and the US uh, Global Digital Connectivity Partnership was launched last year as the outcome of the Japan and US Summit meeting. And the Japan and US Global Digital Connectivity Partnership aims to deepen bilateral cooperation and promote investment of digital technologies, including 5G. And also, um, this is the uh, multilateral cooperation examples. And they are Quad and the Prague um, proposals frameworks. Uh, for example, in the third Prague uh, 5G security conference last year, the U.S. has taken an initiative to bolster 5G supply chain, and Japan was involved in making our telecommunication supply di supplier diversity proposals. The proposal has nine actions for countries to promote supplier diversity and open and interoperative networks. And I believe U.S. and Japan will promote other countries to endorse this proposal. So 5G remains critical issues for both um, US and Japanese government. So I'd like to keep close watch on these international trends. So I'll stop here and thank you for listening. I'm looking forward to your insights and questions. Thank you very much, Rika, for giving us an overview of the US-Japan cooperation on 5G or on policy and for your compre comprehensive overview of what is happening in Japan on 5G developments. Uh, I would like to give the floor uh, to this panel's third speaker, Professor Simon Tay, uh, to talk about digital economy agreements, the necessities and uncertainties of them. Well, thank you very much. I'm humbled to join this discussion. I do so on behalf of both the Institute and our Deputy Director, Jessica Wau, who is heading our digital program. Our program actually is looking at several aspects of digital economy, including the geopolitics, which underpin a lot of these rulemaking efforts, the data flow issues, which are the focus of the two previous presenters. And also, I think, in a new emerging area of great importance to the development of the digital economy, that of sustainability. <clears throat> so in this presentation, I'll try and cover the rise of digital economy agreements, not so much from the multilateral angle, so I'll touch on that, but some of the bilateral and minilateral efforts being made by Singapore, my small country. The second is, of course, the uh, uh, goals of, of trying to get about this reform and uh, adjusting the harmonizing and adjusting the rules for digital economy growth. And also, thirdly, to deal with some of the geopolitical uncertainties and the place that ASEAN, the grouping of 10 Southeast Asian countries, may have in this uh, future. So please allow me to uh, make uh, some points regarding the first, the rise of the digital economy and what we see happening. Obviously, in our region, especially post-pandemic, uh, there have been really uh, extra turbo charge to the increasing digital economy already. Some 60 million new digital consumers have been added 
to the internet economy across this region. Uh, the region is 600 million plus. So this is quite a sizable portion and absolute number. The digital rules though, as I think the speakers have emphasized before me, are really green fields. There are some nascent efforts bilaterally and multilaterally to start, but no definitive rules as for example, in other areas of more traditional economic growth like trade. Frameworks therefore are need, needed to pro promote interoperability to really facilitate the growth, harmonize the standards. And of course, that is both the pressure to uh, keep security and privacy, but also the uh, opportunity of facilitating a much more open sharing of data, which can grow the economies uh, dramatically. So within that framework of much larger players and an uncertain green field atmosphere, with much to play for, Singapore has started a number of digital economy agreements or partnership agreements, DIPAs, with smaller economies, uh, Chile and New Zealand in 2020. And these areas cover uh, a, a electronic authentication and signatures, electronic invoicing, payments, paperless trading, personal information protection, digital identities, cross-border transfer information by electronic means, fintech, reg tech, uh, cooperation, cybersecurity, of course, and artificial intelligence. They're very broad. And the point I want to make here is not just the breadth, but in a way, the audacity of these smaller economies to try to set some sort of standards in these areas. I mean, compared to, say, the Japan-America dialogue, which uh, Rita-san has emphasized. Now, I want to contrast this in terms of where we were with trade agreements 20 years ago as well, when the WTO stalled and failed to progress. So we had to grow that through bilateralism. And I think in many ways, there are echoes in the digital space two decades on. Now with these DAs uh, and DPAs, Singapore has also reached out to Australia, the UK just signed in December, Korea. And my think tank and I have encouraged Japan to consider uh, Singapore. I think though the signal from Japan is they're waiting for America uh, first. Fair enough, uh, given your priorities. China is also officially applied to join not only the CPTPP as noted by our earlier speaker, Ms. Martina, but also the DIPA. They applied in November last year and Canada and Japan have also shown some interest. So this is a moving space uh, in addition to the multilateral and big power efforts. I think this is the same reasons why we are all here to talk about it. There are a lot of opportunities that arise from helping facilitate business move online. And the growth can be very real in, a country, in countries and regions like ASEAN, where the traditional trade has struggled sometimes with border controls and tariffs, et cetera. This really is a chance to reduce barriers to digital trade, to supplement and perhaps even grow more strongly than traditional economic growth. But there are certain requirements. I won't go through all of them, but clearly some are technical, like systems being able to talk to one another. Uh, but beneath that, it's much more about our values. Uh, uh, again, uh, Ms. Martina shared with us a very interesting typology of the three categories she put up. I, I learned a lot from that because basically there is a, a need to color, color, categorize or color the attitudes of the countries towards openness or control, business innovation versus government regulation and control. And in this sense, we face very old debates about the role of the state and the free market enterprise. Here in ASEAN, uh, we have 10 members dedicated to grow the economy, but we cannot run away from the diversity of their government systems, their ability to implement and control in various areas, including data. And in that sense, the underlying historical traditions they have about the role of the state and the growth of the free market enterprise. On top of this, we really do face that uh, the region is under tension from global issues. If there were guiding rules at a broader level, at the global level, then I think ASEAN would be more comfortable or the DPRs would be more comfortable to grow within them. But in a way, these bilateral efforts and ASEAN-wide efforts are being made in the absence of global leadership. Why do we lack global leadership in this area? It's not an innocent problem. I would like to point in that sense, geopolitically, 
to the Sino-American competition. I mean, you all know it better than I do. These are really tech wars. Uh, and we in Singapore are quite happily the hub for the region for both the American companies as well as their Chinese competitors. Sometimes both of them can come around the table and see it as a global technology, global supply chains, but they too face the fact that the governments they come from don't see it that way. And this contest for leadership in core technologies that is like 5G, artificial intelligence and semiconductors are really pressuring the supply chains and the markets to cleave and perhaps bifurcate. And this is not particularly good for anybody looking for global efficient solutions and harmonized rules. The CPTPP has been mentioned. And obviously this has gone ahead in both traditional trade areas and the, bio, and the digital area without the Americans present. Americans hope to return to the region in some new way. We had Commerce Secretary Raimundo coming through talking about this new way. They have yet to articulate exactly what they mean. But no doubt America's size, leadership in many areas will lead countries of ASEAN and the region to listen when America is ready to present what it truly means. But we mustn't forget China. China has become, in many sectors, including digital, a key player. China has expressed interest to join the CPTPP, and there is a political issue in this, particularly because Taiwan has also applied to join the CPTPP. And my, my little country is somehow chairing the accession process. So we can talk about this if it should interest people, but it's really a more political issue rather than a technical one at this point, point in time. China is in RCEP and keen on DEPA. I would say to a question posed earlier, why this is so, is that there are, in a way, many voices emerging from China about the economy. Some of them are truly internationalists, but we to see China continue to play a hub role, a sense of gravity as a global node in production chains of all kinds, including the digital space. But others, of course, are much more nationalistic and conscious of data regulation and control. And this does mean that a giant country like China, I guess a bit like America, speaks with several voices, different interests within the country itself. But otherwise, we hope that the Indo-Pacific strategy that America is pushing will help introduce higher standards to govern the growing digital economy with promotion of free cross-border, free flow of cross-border data, government-to-government -government collaboration, and of course, a balance with consumer privacy protections. Whether the European model is the right one, I think remains to be seen by other players. And in this sense, the time necessitates ASEAN to think about how the 10 countries can themselves form their interoperable block with their own standards. And one of the first steps has come towards a ASEAN Digital Economy Framework Agreement by 2025. Uh, there are continued uncertainties, and I'll end here. This is one of them was clearly that this is not merely a, 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 a political exercise, nor an economic one, but one of mixed issues. Uh, the, the ghost of security is often mentioned uh, and I don't mean this just as a scare tactic. There are some real concerns, but we can't run away that this is an area of major influence by framing the rules for the digital economy, those countries will gain a competitive advantage. This makes the area one of contestation and there is both a need for multilateral efforts to bring in diverse countries, that's like ASEAN in miniature, 10, but still very diverse, as well as more like-minded initiatives Though different in some ways, Singapore and New Zealand, Singapore and Chile are very old partners in cross-Pacific uh, trade and other agreements. In this sense, the values about data ownership, privacy, protection, I'm not sure they add up to an ideology, but the certain implications of how we think about these issues. The technical needs are clearly there to harmonize standards, portability, and I hope we can avoid a bifurcation of the system. But given the geopolitical tensions, I think this will be very difficult. I want to signal just one last point before closing off. In addition to this geopolitical things here emphasized, I think there will be also new issues of sustainability and social equity in the development of the digital economy and the standards we set. And these questions too are fraught with social value choices we make about how to grow this space.
Thank you. I'll stop here. Thank you very much, Professor Tay. Um, I would like to give the floor now to our discussant, Mihoko Matsubara. And um, I would actually like, after uh, Ms. Matsubara-san will conclude her, her comments, I would like to give the floor to the speakers because it might happen that she has to leave earlier. So this way we make sure that uh, you'll also hear the reflections and you can have a discussion on what you have to say. Thank you so much. And I really appreciate the wonderful presentation from the other three speakers and the fantastic overview of 5G, foreign cross-border data policies and digital economy agreements. So it seems that the overarching uh, keywords for all the speakers are open versus conditional or degraded or controlled and global versus national interest. And as the world has become more digitized during this pandemic, uh, cybersecurity and privacy have become more important than ever. And we have to think about on how to integrate this cybersecurity and privacy concepts into 5G or cross border data and digital economy. And, and also their rule making processes. So first speaker, uh, Dr. Martina Parkin discussed the geopolitics of data policies in the Indo-Pacific and compared uh, different regional agreements and policies uh, in different countries. And I really appreciate it. And while the regional, um, uh, this region already uh, has so diversified agreements by uh, at the multilateral or minilateral or even national levels. I'm wondering uh, what kind of impact the ongoing war in Ukraine would have or impose on future cross-border data transactions because the uh, geopolitical tensions are already out there in the Indo-Pacific regions and what kind of impacts this war would have uh, in terms of open model that uh, Dr. Farken talked about uh, in the future. And the second speaker, uh, Ms. Vika Tsunoda, uh, offered her uh, a wonderful presentations and analysis of Japan, US, and also a quad cooperation on 5G, 6G and ORAN, and making comparison between vendor lock-in and multi-vendor approaches. Also, uh, thank you so much for uh, sharing uh, NTT's uh, co uh, contribution to uh, 5G technologies and global standardization. Um, if I may, um, I'm curious to ask uh, Ms. Tsunoda um, about uh, the recent uh, concerns are uh, raised by um, Europe uh, in terms of uh, how Oran can ensure uh, security by design uh, into 5G technologies. And the final speaker, uh, Mr. Simon Tay, talked about uh, Asia and digital economy agreement uh, under the, the existing digital economy aims to facilitate uh, business moving online, govern electronic transactions, reduce barriers to digital trade, and enhance corporations on digital innovations. That's wonderful and I'm really encouraged to, to hear that. And he also emphasized that such agreements would be based on five requirements such as constant dialogues, uh, parties need to be like-minded in information sharing and balance between uh, open and control, which uh, uh, Dr. Farakin also talked about. So the, Mr. T already uh, talked a lot about the, the ongoing tech war or competition uh, between the United States and China has uh, complicated the digital agreements 
And I'm wondering how the world or even the Indo-Pacific region can alleviate the already heightened uh, geopolitical tensions to in order to facilitate the digital economy agreements and innovations. And also, to, I'd like to follow up uh, one point that was emphasized by Prof, uh, Professor Tays and also Ms. Tsunoda about the sustainability and the social values and also photonics network. Because now these problems or challenges have been addressed by a global tech alliance called uh, Innovative Optical and Wireless Network or ION Global Forum, IOWN Global Forum. This ION Global uh, Forum was uh, founded uh, in Delaware, United States in January 2020 to produce end-to-end uh, -to -end full stack photonics based ICT infrastructure. So this war in uh, Ukraine and consequent economic sanctions on Russia have made global energy supplies even more challenged in this climate crisis. And the world now is in urgent need to develop an eco-friendly ICT infrastructure package and be mindful of power consumption. And according to digital reality uh, estimations, the data centers around the world already consume 3% of all electricity uh, used in the world, or it is actually larger than all the electric power uh, consumed by the United Kingdom. So this is huge, and we really need to make sure that how we can produce a next generation full stack um, power consumption friendly uh, uh, ICT infrastructure when we are uh, also to uh, pursue uh, 5G and beyond in the future. Because the uh, 5G or beyond will uh, produce uh, more internet connected devices and it will surely uh, create more data and we need more data centers. So how we can make sure to, to keep a good balance between uh, big data uh, innovations and power consumption. So here is a solutions uh, 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 addressed by the ION Global Forum uh, founded in January 2020. So this um, ION Global Forum uh, seeking to decrease power consumption by 100 times and increase transmission capacity by 125 times and reduce end-to-end uh, -end latency by 200 times to support a smarter world by 2030. And to do this, um, you need to have a um, ICT infrastructure, not only to cover a uh, wireless network, which uh, ION focuses on, but also uh, non-wireless or core networks uh, beyond uh, base stations. So it means that you have to have a uh, global tech alliance because no one specific company can produce all the necess necessary technologies to cover uh, such a uh, diversified full stack ICT infrastructure. So that is why this uh, ION Global Forum was founded. And as of February 2022, uh, 91 companies uh, belong to this initiative from diversified uh, industrial sectors, such as auto manufacturers, finance, food, chemical, ICT, cybersecurity, semiconductors, and telecommunications from Europe, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, and the United States. And this is to, to make sure that uh, their efforts uh, to bring in um, uh, diversified technologies 
to offer a better product to the market. So I am very pleased to hear that uh, there are so many um, uh, regional and national level of uh, initiatives are going on to produce uh, better technologies and also overarching agreements uh, coordinated between the different countries. And because, however, since innovations are based upon the um, the coordination between the governments to produce uh, practical policies, but also companies to innovate uh, technologies. Uh, we need to make sure that in the future agreements, but also innovations, on a, in a hub, and then make sure to have uh, on, uh, continued uh, dialogues uh, between the regional but also global level of public-private partnerships. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mihoko. Uh, I would give the floor now to the speakers and maybe in the order as how you presented. So starting with Martina. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, well, uh, your question about uh, Ukraine is uh, very uh, interesting and uh, I, as um, the war started, I, I, I've been looking into what Russia has done through also data policies in in this war, and uh, and the fact that the fact that Russia has not joined any agreement on uh, transfer of, of data already says something about uh, uh, the um, kind of intention uh, of a country to then undergo this kind of uh, like uh, initiatives. Um, and, and, and the fact that China has worked very actively uh, over the past 10 years to create an alternative internet, uh, a shadow internet, so they can disconnect from the global internet uh, if needed, is like can only be explained uh, uh, by considering that the country would was already willing to to go uh, in war in some in some situation because they they like it's it's a kind of like you cannot do make uh, you cannot avoid making this connection and thinking about this and uh, so the the way in which the Russian in, uh, telecom infrastructure works and the policies that have been put in place over the past uh, uh, at least like ten years have made it possible now to conduct uh, uh, wide uh, censorship throughout the country, uh, control uh, the flow of information, um, which would be much harder to do uh, if there was an open uh, framework of transfer of data. Um, so I think uh, that in this sense, um, like uh, this kind of, of, uh, of policies uh, help a lot to control the flow of information. So I think that uh, the war uh, in Ukraine and, uh, um, um, and and the way in which the, these policies are being used now make a case for having a, an open flow of data because it shows that uh, democracies are willing uh, to create the infrastructure and, uh, and the, the regulatory environment to make sure that uh, even if there was an extreme situation of war, there will still be a free uh, com information flowing in and out from the countries. Uh, in terms of security, I think that's all a different issue. And I, 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 I don't think that uh, keeping uh, data with in the country and the way in which Russia is, is doing um, supports the country uh, to defend it, itself uh, uh, from eventual cybersecurity attacks. I think that uh, they will happen anyway. Uh, so um, yeah, I, th I think the, yeah, the situation makes a case for uh, having more security, but not to keep uh, the data uh, within the country. Um, but it's, it's something to 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 think about and 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 yeah to to also research to see how, what in practice is being uh, uh, countries are doing um, in these situations and and usually when when I was researching the cross border data flows of the past years I was always uh, thinking okay there is the extreme situation if a war starts and I always consider it to be very extreme but now this really comes into the picture when analyzing a, a cross border data flows so it's uh, yeah something that for sure will we will consider more and more when. Uh, uh, considering how to regulate uh, cross-border data flows.
Yes, Trika, please, if you have any, any comments that you would like to share too. Oh, okay, so thank you so much for um, Matsubara san for um, like summarizing our presentations of our keywords. And I'd like to um, answer your first and second question. And I think the first question is how the OPRAM uh, could contribute to the security by design in European countries' FABG um, networks. And I believe that um, an and I really believe that OpenLAN could contribute to the uh, security in their 5G networks in European countries. For example, um, as far I first explained uh, in our presentation, OpenLAN is um, um, OpenLAN um, contributes to the um, to um, contributes to um, more vendors uh, to uh, participate in their um, 5G market. And so Operan um, really contribute to the transparency of their uh, of the networks. And now, for example, um, in, in the UK, a UK actually banned foreign equipment, actually. And then the UK proposed the D10 alliance. And D10 alliance made up of um is uh, made up of 10 democratic uh, like-minded countries, um G7 member states, plus um, Australia, India, and South Korea. And these uh, D10 alliance um promote um promote the um Opera, um, um, Opera networks of 5G. And if these um, 5G networks are transparent and reliable um, networks, and um, it's spread um, in um, not only US and Japan, but also in um, European countries, uh, I think it would help uh, security of the 5G networks and more transparent and reliable 5G networks. And thank you for um, and thank you for raising up a really interesting point about the. Uh, I own, um, I own the uh, all photonic networks. And um, could you repeat the uh, second question? Oh no, Order. it was not really a question. It was just a comment to add up to the because you referred oh. to the photonics uh, networks and uh, because uh, the, uh, the Professor Tate also talked about uh, sustainability and okay. because the, the, that balance can be achieved through the, the technologies would be produced by ION Global Forum. So that's why I, I, did, I, I just wanted to, to, to share uh, my perspectives on the ION Thank Global Forum. Thank you for sharing their perspective. And I, I really agree with your idea. And I think it's very important to develop all photonic networks, not uh, for the for developing 5G and beyond the 5G networks, and also achieve not only like reliable 5G networks, but also uh, to achieve like power consumption. And in Japan, now Japan established Beyond the 5G and Consortium. Um, this organization promotes collaboration among industry, academia, and government to share their R&D and standardization efforts, and also hold international conferences to accelerate international cooperation. And also, as I, um, explained in my presentation, Japanese government allocated R&D funds for Beyond 5G. And I believe that a Japanese government um, uh, with like-minded countries um, developed their all photonic networks R&D RD project. And now Japanese, um, now uh, the NICT, uh, NIC National Institute of ICT has openly sought 6G R&D project proposal. And I hope in through these um, proposals, and I hope um, 5G or photonic networks uh, has been developed through this project and with like-minded countries. If I could respond to some of the points uh, commentator made. First, I want to thank her for reading the paper so thoroughly. She even referred to points I didn't get to in my oral presentation. Thank you. Um, I would like to address specifically the question of sustainability. Uh, I used to be the chairman of the National Environment Agency for the Singapore government. And the question of energy pricing is a critical one for efficiency in all sectors. So in a sense, the higher energy prices are an opportunity to push harder. We can always hope that uh, industry-led initiatives like the ones you've mentioned can find a solution but they do need the incentive, not just a sort of moral uh, question, but they are profit seeking companies and therefore higher prices without energy subsidies that push the issue onto data companies is seriously a good kind of pressure to find new ways to make data centers more efficient. I mean, my country is facing this very directly for various reasons, including our policy framework and our relative stability of both energy and politics, 
we are seen to be a good location for data centers, but the carbon costs are simply too high per capita in Singapore. So we have pushed this as a pricing issue. We've introduced carbon pricing across the board, and we will not make an exception for data centers. More than that, specific data centers, we are requiring that before any new data centers are built and committed to, the companies that propose them will have to find a carbon solution. They will either have to be much more efficient, uh, multiples of efficiency, not just 10 or 20%, multiples of efficiency in cooling the data centers down, or they will have to find innovative ways of finding carbon offsets, carbon permits in our region. Our region has actually a vast potential of nature-based conservation and climate credits, carbon credits, but these are relatively undeveloped. So if these companies can want to have a data center, but can develop a nature-based solution, we hope to give them their cake and also you know, eat it in the sense of getting two wins. So I think this is a relatively good approach to try to deal with this problem. But we'll have to also deal with the broader issues, not just for data flows and data centers, which is the focus of this topic, but the broader digital economy. You know, Though the platforms are digital and empowered by data centers, in the end, the delivery of that last mile across the border or just simply from the storage center to the household is an all economy issue. And in this pandemic, so many countries, including mine, are seeing that last mile with carbon guzzling vans and motorbikes, et cetera. So we really got to ask these companies to take a kind of supply chain responsibility as we see in many other areas of trade, we can't make an exception to the digital economy and data flows. On the geopolitics, I mean, I am a bit skeptical whether these efforts by small countries like mine can really make a strong headway, not just because the great powers aren't committed, but they are actually in conflict. Uh, and you know, these small country efforts can be buffeted by these, by these big country ambitions. The bifurcation threat is very real, both at the economic level but also at the company level. So here in Singapore, as I mentioned, we have Chinese and American companies. Huawei is here in Singapore. And without taking their side necessarily, I have to say that they clearly show signs that they're getting ready to bifurcate. And this is not good for a global economy. So this goes back to the question of that balance of openness and uh, 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 control and this idea of security versus freedom, uh, the values we talk about. We also have to think about whether we see this as truly a global system or in a weird way, we're all like Russia, all getting ready to pull back into our own uh, uh, enclosed, much smaller ponds. And we hope that ASEAN doesn't have to do so, that we can find a path, be pathfinders to help uh, and the deeper too, for the big companies, countries to come along and in a way agree on certain levels of agreement and disagreement. Like in the trade area, RCEP and CPTPP are actually very different agreements but they are both head towards the same direction of more liberalization, whereas in the trade world, much of this has stopped. Thank you very much for your reflections uh, to Mihoko's um, comments. Uh, please also jump in later if you're still here with us and you would like to add any comments. Uh, so I will also make a couple of remarks um, as yesterday and today, uh, the conference is focusing on security, prosperity and values. I would like to make a couple of comments around that and um, especially a uh, couple of issues regarding regulating anything that is linked to security between countries. Uh, Martina uh, talked a little bit about the European adequacy decisions um, and uh, and these specific adequacy decisions are focusing on the movement of personal data. And we, we mainly hear about this uh, with regard to privacy, even though the, the agreement that regulates these adequacy decisions also does mention security. However, I think it would be interesting, and I know you know this about quite well as well, that there's another agreement uh, in the EU that specifically regulating non-personal data, so regulation on, on framework for the free flow of non-personal data. And it is supposed to, you know, uh, secure free flow of data. However, 
their EU member states uh, have the right to uh, to take uh, exceptions on security. Uh, I mean, it specifically says public security threat in that case. And this list has just been published. And actually, the carve outs list is extremely long, which and I mean, Mar Martina also show other examples of how security exceptions are written in agreements. There's always this extremely wide carve out. Um, and I wonder, do you think there is really a way forward to actually <laughs> regulate security? And what do you see in your in your in your daily practice? Is there some sort of a shift uh, where we would have more predictability as there is always kind of this unpredictability if yeah, things will be pulled out as Professor Tay said that they're kind of everyone is ready to to take actions uh, if need be. Yeah. And um, I'm yeah, I'm very happy that Mihoko is here then and she was able to give uh, substantial comments to Rika as I do know less about 5G and Oron. Um, however, I think I would also like to ask you um, what do you think are the be the main developments with regard to data regulation with uh, 5G and Oron and uh, what are the positive aspects that do you see that we move kind of a more coherent harmonization of rules as there is cooperation? And then um, with regard to Professor Tay, um, I mean, you've talked about um, topics that are very close to my heart. And I also personally focus a lot on WTO law, so multilateralism and bilateralism. And you you started and ended your presentation talking about harmonization. And I can see that this is also very close to your heart to find ways to still harmonize as the multilateralism kind of stopped working on, on unfortunately. And then we moved to bilateral agreements. However, what do you think about how is the situation with digital economy agreements? Because we kind of, as you also pointed out, we're still moving in the same direction. And um, the studies about the utilization rates of free trade agreements is already, they're not really even able to grasp how it exactly works. They know it better about trading goods with trade and services is still, <laughs> there's still a lot of research to do. And I mean, now on top of that, we have separate agreements on everything that's linked to digitalism, which is even harder to grasp. And in a way, it is linked to trade and services and then not. So do you think there is some sort of way to still find a, also a coherent way forward uh, where countries could try to harmonize as even as you've, you know, uh, Singapore is extremely active. Uh, and doing a great job. But I think also in your agreements, there are some differences that you can cannot really apply to every country in the same way that that um, does create uh, complexities for companies. And then we end up again in this situation where where big companies are able to kind of grasp what is happening in these agreements, but the uh, SMEs are struggling as they don't have the power to buy expert to to uh, hire experts uh, who would help them to understand these specific agreements. Um, and please, I'll, uh, I'll again uh, start maybe with Martina if that's okay, and and Mihoko if you would also like to jump jump in after Professor Day, please feel free. Uh, thanks for the question, Maria. Um, well, regarding the the security exceptions, um, what we are seeing is uh, um, uh, evidently an increase uh, in the uh, wi uh, wideness of the exceptions on security, uh, and this has also been discussed uh, in the WTO with uh, with the exception on security and the guts um, and. Uh, Given the time in which we are, in which we are seeing an in, uh, increasing securitization of trade, and the, the discussion is more and more about security, I don't think this is the time in which we will find any agreement on uh, an exception on security with a clear language, which is not self-judging. Uh, this, is, I think, is will be very hard. Uh, the, the highest uh, level of ambition that we could have is uh, having something that uh, resembles the uh, language of guts, I think. Uh, they got security exception, and even there, I mean, at, at least there, there is some uh, kind of uh, 
uh, language. Um, but having said that, I think that nevertheless it could be a time to to have a discussion because uh, the the problem around uh, uh, security and data flows is that uh, countries are uh, scared and often uh, when it comes especially to developing economies, uh, there is a lack of understanding of the implication of uh, free flow of data on security. So one uh, important uh, thing that could be done, and there is not enough uh, of this, is the creating um, space and opportunity for uh, an open discussion about how um, a free flow of data can or cannot, especially impact security, so that countries are aware of um, of uh, alternatives to restricting the free flow of data that's, that can help the country to feel uh, safe and secure. Uh, an option could be to um, have uh, uh, multi, uh, some uh, regional or uh, um, some smaller agreement between a group of countries uh, that uh, uh, can collaborate uh, and, um, and, sh and also um, co collaborate on uh, how to safely protect data within a certain region something that uh, for example in the uh, in in africa is being discussed now in the african um, uh, free trade agreement um, so this could be an option and and i think if anything this is a time to discuss uh, other types of commitments that uh, uh, could be made uh, for example uh, on interoperability uh, on uh, um, uh, making sure that at least, at least when it comes to certain sectors, we can support the free flow of data. In, in uh, Asia, there is a lot of restrictions um, on health data, on financial data, um, on uh, location data. So one uh, area uh, for uh, collaboration and, uh, and, and for taking actual binding commitments could be a sectoral discussion, a technical sectoral discussion, some of these uh, uh, areas. And, and just to conclude, I wanted to add another question to Professor uh, Tay's questions uh, on uh, the ideas, uh, because we have seen the days coming up as a, uh, especially the, the DEPA. The DEPA was supposed to be an open plurilateral. So this is really basically uh, adding a bit to the Maria's question, Maria's questions on this. Uh, it was supposed to be an open plurilateral, uh, but what we are seeing is that uh, it is not uh, working as an open plurilateral so far. Uh, and, uh, and Singapore is like doing other agreements with other countries instead of having countries joining this DEPA. Why is this the case? And uh, um, why is, isn't is DEPA growing um, and adding these new partners instead of uh, replicating uh, new agreements? Thanks. Okay. Thank you. So, so can I um, comment on your on your coming, thank you. Um, so thank you for the great question, Maria. So I'd like to, so for the regarding the like um, regulation of the 5G and the development, main development area, I'd like to highlight the plug proposals that I explained in my presentation. This is not kind of the regulation, this is a proposal, but the proposal uh, was, um, the proposal uh, was um, made in the, an, in, November 30 and 2021 in Plague Confluence, and it was proposed by the Czech Republic government. And uh, uh, Japan and the US and Australia and India and the United Kingdom support this proposal. And the proposal says that uh, open and supports the open and the interoperative telecom networks and the support supplier diversity. Um, for to uh, supply uh, to uh, contribute to the supply chain uh, resiliency and more secure and tr transparent and and reliable infrastructure and I think um, this proposal is a uh, kind of main development area in the 5G and this is uh, not the kind of the data regulation but uh, this is um, kind of multilateral um, proposals uh, to develop a secure and transparent 5G and including open run. Thank you for the commented question. May I go next? Um, I think that the questions relate to the sort of strategy going forward and the s seeming discontinence of the deeper approach versus bilaterals with other countries and the different standards in them. Uh, if I may, I'll answer this more broadly um, because in a way it really reflects how a small country behaves. Uh, we would like to have global leadership by the large powers that can really set a clear path forward, uh, a highway if you want, and we can all travel down this road 
happily together as once we did on trade a long time ago. But we, we don't live in that world today, uh, on this sector particularly. And overall, there is a certain win-lose equation and great power rivalry. Uh, so what does a small state like Singapore do? Uh, and compared to the Japan or the EU or America or China, we, we are a small state. We see ourselves that way. We could do nothing, but my country tends to be a bit hyperactive. Uh, so we decided to come to the highest possible standard agreement with our old trade partners like Chile and New Zealand. We've done the first bilateral FTA with them 20 plus years ago, and we were very happy, uh, very comfortable to do the first fairly high standard digital agreement with them. Should we stop there, as Martina suggests, was our thought at one point, and other people must sign on to that standard. Um, that would have a certain purity, but we often see that we are not demanders. We, we cannot make everyone come to the standard we want. We are much more interlocutors, similar for our bilateral FTA strategy. We tend to take rules, rather impose rules. And we sometimes do that for a strategic reason. For example, we have now have a separate effort to bring in uh, 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 Vietnam, a digital trade agreement really is a window opportunity for Singapore to have Vietnam, a major ASEAN economy, join us in shaping these digital rules. Vietnam may be ready, but really we're not quite sure uh, whether it can come to the same standard that Deepa uh, suggests. We were quite uh, happy, but a little bit physical, whether China, who expressed interest in Deepa, can come to the standard and really deliver, which is by my earlier comment about many voices in China. Some really see it as an anchor for reform, and others, you know, uh, the, the security trumps their, their concerns of the growth. So I, I think this is, uh, again, going back to the, the bilateral free trade agreement strategy we had 20 plus years ago, which I helped negotiate one of the first ones with Japan, uh, you know, when I was a young man. Um, there really is an effort to get a certain volume of agreements and leave the question of harmonization to a bit later. When the issues, as you mentioned, some developing countries have certain misgivings, not necessarily founded in fact about the technologies that allow data flow. Uh, we need to give them time to assure, take a small step forward before asking them to move further and faster. So we will have these various uh, paths forward, and then we will try to come to a place data. Uh, and we've done this in trade. You know, before we had RCEP, and I'm not saying RCEP is a perfect agreement, we had all the ASEAN plus ones with all the different, uh, and Marty, Mar Marja knows this much better than I do, she's a trade expert, you know, different harmoni this unharmonized rules or origins, etc. Now we finally got them more or less on one page. The, the big issue, of course, is at the present, will be the big companies that can navigate the various uneven uh, uh, policy paths. Uh, we, we aren't in that perfect place yet. But that's why the sustainability issue and the equity issues become critical. Uh, when we start to frame it that way, we'll see that we have to even out and harmonize so that the barriers really come down for everyone. Mihoko, would you also like to add something here? Just in case checking. Uh, sure, thank you. Um, so, uh... Professor Te uh, repeatedly uh, talked about the size of uh, the territorial size of Singapore. However, I personally really appreciate the leading role that the Singaporean government and also industry have played uh, in the region in terms of cybersecurity capacity building. Because uh, your government uh, have been uh, making utmost efforts to bring up the cybersecurity level uh, and uh, generously providing a uh, capacity building training on the uh, policy making uh, support for other countries as, uh, uh, at the unilateral level, but also the multilateral and the uh, um, minilateral levels and, and over the last uh, multiple years. And this um, efforts and uh, these efforts uh, contribute not only to cybersecurity itself, but since that uh, the old the uh, the world now uh, have been uh, making the progresses toward now uh, 
uh, the smarter world, uh, especially during this pandemic. So I am sure that you know, these kinds of efforts by the Singaporean government and also that the partner countries you know, would uh, make um, much contributions to 5G and beyond. And thank you for that. May I just quickly respond to that? I want to thank Mihoko um, san for that compliment to my country and government. But really, I would say that we are much less leaders and try to be facilitators and uh, pathfinders. We believe that the training and sharing of dialogues, et cetera, helps people understand it why it's in their interest to move forward. We can't lead them or push them forward if that's what leadership sometimes means. Um, we are much more, in a way, too small to play that role. Uh, my uh, co-author, Jessica Wau, who is a kind of online digital tutor for me, has also mentioned a point I forgot to make. Um, when I talked about the different agreements, I tended to say that the deeper was the highest standard and the bilaterals like Vietnam was trying just to be introductory level. There are differences and variances though. We have a DEA, Digital Economic Agreement with Australia, and it's tailor-made to some areas like uh, le electronic authentication, submarine uh, telco cable systems, which we have specially with them. And so it's uh, attached to our free trade agreement with them. So we tend to tailor make first and then figure out how to reconcile them later. Thank you very much. I'm just in case checking with the technical staff that I'm not missing any questions. Uh, please let me know if I am. Um, otherwise, uh, I think you've all very well elaborated on on the importance of the talks uh, on the practices and experience in this field. And I do hope, uh, yeah, the learning process will be quicker here than maybe it was with uh, bilateral agreements and that will try to move forward in a more harmonized way quicker. Uh, I very much liked what yesterday uh, during uh, the first panel, uh, Mike okano Hyman's uh, mentioned that what is very important in this field is that we maybe don't even first talk about regulatory cooperation, but that we talk about coordination and finding synergies in regulations first. And I think indeed the practice what's happening now is, is useful that um, to, to move towards that and hopefully there will be more talks between, uh, between countries. Uh, I would like to maybe give everyone uh, the floor for final concluding uh, remarks, as we still have a couple of minutes left. Uh, shall I start? Uh, maybe uh, just one point that has not been raised, and uh, and and this also like to, to ask to the other speakers what they think about it is uh, is about the um, application of uh, of China to the CPTPP, which uh, I I really uh, consider. Um, uh, very important when it comes to uh, the future of cross-border data flow regulation in the region, uh, because what we are what we have seen is uh, like China's willingness and 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 considering seriously to join CPTPP, which is the agreement with the highest level of commitment on cross-border data flows. And I wonder what what is the uh, game that China wants to play? Because on one hand, uh, like um, it is unfeasible uh, that China would do the regulatory changes needed to have to comply with the CPTPP standard. Um, so I, uh, and also because of the last years, they, they are increasing their controls and restrictions. They are not reducing them. So there is really not a commitment like, uh, for example, in Indonesia or maybe in Vietnam, we'll see. Um, so. If, like on one end, I've read uh, some uh, some people saying that uh, uh, we should let uh, we uh, Japan and the uh, countries, the signatories of the CPTPP, should let China in the agreement so that there is a space, uh, a ground for discussion on data. But if we do that, uh, we are basically making the commitment worthless because then uh, if if China could join CPTPP any country in the world could join the CPTPP and then there is no leverage anymore to let a country like Vietnam take regulatory uh, changes and uh, and remove restrictions on the basis of uh, of the commitments taken in the agreement. So I, I just uh, wanted to raise this point and also hear what uh, the other speakers think about this. Thanks. So may I go next? 
Thank you so much for thank you for raising very interesting pop topic, um, Dr. Um, Simon and Dr. Martina, and um, <clears throat> and also making some making great comment for Matsubara Sam. And I think um, it's very complicated topics whether the China is uh, whether China is going to join or not uh, CPTPP. And uh, I'd like to highlight um, um, highlight um, Matsubara Sam said uh, our our overarching overarching keywords in our presentations like open versus con conditional conditional and or global versus uh, national interest and in my 5g topic um so um, to to promote open run i think it's kind of um and it's going to um like to make um make and achieve um competitive market um versus um versus a kind of vendor locking market model of foray so i think uh these um overarching keywords like open versus uh, close or global versus national interest um i think um this is a really uh, good uh, point for like uh, summarize our presentation and thank you so much if Thank I could you. I'm, some... I, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt. I'll just as as much of our son has to leave in a, in a, in a minute. I'll give her the floor first, and then uh, come to your professor Tay. Please certainly. Professor Tay, uh, I'm terribly sorry about this. Oh, um, no, I, I don't want to be rude. No, please, so thank please you so ahead, much please. for the wonderful presentations from the, the, the all the three speakers and the wonderful moderations by uh, Maria. And now I'm really encouraged to hear that even though that we face geopolitical tensions and the take war uh, between the, the big countries, but we still making the progresses toward the regional and global agreements for data transactions and 5G and ORAN. Of course, and then I'm not too optimistic that we can reach uh, cons global consensus to, to, to solve the, all the problems. But as long as you know, we continue our dialogues and you know, at least you know, we can make uh, uh, pr processes for uh, better innovations and then also to for the better uh, and secure smarter world. Thank you. Well, thank you uh, for that. And I want to also thank the whole panel. I've learned a lot and so has my co-author Jessica Wau. Um, I want to say that um, we must avoid bifurcation. I think we should try our best to do so. Otherwise, there will be so much cost. And oftentimes in the name of security, we don't actually evaluate the cost. It's such a broad label and such an urgent call for security that we sometimes forget there will be costs not only to the big companies, but to the consumers and to the small companies. And these barriers become insurmountable. Um, so I think that the opportunities of the digital economy, including data as, as the kind of gold mine of, of that uh, uh, business is huge. And it is one of the few truly bright sparks uh, as we come out of this terrible pandemic, not just for health reasons terrible, but economic tragedies visit so many households. It's really something that should be allowed to grow, of course, with justifications and protections. And I think this is where governments should start to take steps forward as far as they're comfortable to understand each other better, have those dialogues and find partners they can encourage and find some you know, sort of comparable standards with like the EU has. It doesn't include everybody, but I think they are trying to find some partners they can have substantive uh, uh, adequacy provisions, et cetera, like Korea. So I think these are all steps to be encouraged. We won't come to a global agreement in the short term, but I think if we keep moving forward, there will be this patchwork of agreements. And there may come a time where perhaps different regimes in the great powers will see that this is truly a global phenomenon, needs global rules, and having this uh, series of dialogues and attempts to close gaps and uh, increase understanding, we will be able to reach for a much more harmonized playing field. But I guess this might take quite a lot of time, given the practical uh, tensions we talk about today. So I'm, I'm glad to have joined this conversation. Thank you very much for including us in Singapore. Thank you very much to all of the speakers. Uh, unfortunately, our discussant had to had to leave, uh, but we were very happy to have her here today. Uh, thank you very much for your on-spot presentations and comments. Uh,
Uh, it was a pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, this wraps up uh, this panel and stay tuned for, for the next panel. Thank you very much. Thank you.